And to discuss uh, the significance of this uh, milestone uh, for the basic education department in South Africa, we're joined now by education expert, Professor Mary Metcalf. Uh, a very good evening to you, Professor, and thank you so much for speaking to us. It's a good achievement, and I hate to dampen the euphoria, but I am wondering what happens if there is another wave. Has our school system, mm -hmm. you know, built within its system enough entrenched practices that can carry us through should this happen, that we'd be hit by another wave? It's a very interesting question, Sapiso, because I think your first assumption is a correct assumption. We have to follow the science. If there are any significant changes in terms of how COVID is operating, we have to accept that it may be possible that we would have to go back to a range of measures. But my understanding is that the scientists are saying that in terms of COVID, we really have some significant changes which has made the return to school possible. Firstly, there are very high levels of immunity in terms of what we currently are facing in the country. The immunity levels are as high as 70%, and that's because so many people have had COVID without even knowing it. So we've got high levels of immunity and we have some vaccinations, and we need to increase the level of vaccination in the country. Hmm. I, I think that parents need to be saying, we need our children back at school, let's contribute to the vaccination initiative and contribute to the growing levels of immunity. So the first question is, can it happen again? Of course, but hopefully not. The second question is, what is the resilience in the system to cope with another setback? Well, in the first instance, one of the things that has really impressed me in talking to schools, and there was a Pepo Funde campaign where we profiled the success stories of the many principals across the country who were finding solutions to problems that we hadn't even imagined. And across urban and rural areas, it was inspiring to me to talk to principals who were saying, this is what we did to solve our problems. So sometimes I think we underestimate the inherent resilience and the commitment of educators mm -hmm. to make sure that the system functions and that learners are educated. And you raise very good points, which are very important Professor Metcalf, I'm just looking back to when the Democratic Alliance took this matter of rotational schooling to court, for instance. One of the things that it was saying was that there is no need for, uh, or at least there are no immediate dangers of uh, primary school going children of getting COVID because at the time the science told us that children were less affected and to Omicron though um, it was less severe and its symptoms we started seeing rising number of children who are susceptible so as you say parents should do their part but their parents who are already saying what if I'm not sure about you know vaccinating my children there's an age limit for which children need to be uh, doing there's obviously the availability of such and uh, in the planning the the minister of basic education t spoke about a ppe that teachers are going to be expected to have this on all the time etc etc so uh, there is resilience but the school infrastructure at large is it ready yeah Okay, so let me take each of those questions. I think the science is very clear from what everything that, that I've read and I've been part of consultations with scientists, mm -hmm. that there is a diminishing risk with age. Children of school-going age from grades, the, the early years of grade R and up, are much less at risk than people who, who are old. We know that. So the age group that is protected now by vaccinations is 12 years and up, 
and the age group that is between grade R and 12 is not yet eligible for vaccines because the science is saying that the investment in vaccines for them is really not necessary because the risks are so low. But the question of risks, I'm going to try and link to your question about infrastructure. You see, when one looks at risks and when one looks at precautions, there's risks associated with COVID and the evidence is clear that it's minimal for children and that um, vaccination reduces the risk of serious illness for those who are older. But there's another set of risks, Tipiso, and those risks are the risks of what is happening if children are not attending school regularly. There's so much evidence now of those risks, and I think you might probably want to come back and talk about, or ask about and discuss mm -hmm. Those risks. No, of sure, children I not was coming to that, school. but I just thought we should dispense with the obvious first because it, it, it's great to celebrate now. Yes. But I think COVID has surprised many of us when we thought uh, we've climbed a hill, we find ourselves uh, at, at, at an even bigger hill or even a mountain. A um, lot of unforeseen things that we've experienced with COVID 19, and, and that would include the high dropout rate. Uh, we've seen more than 50% of the curriculum being lost due to that. and. Uh, so many others so lessons uh, to learn from that I understand that there are already plans to trim the curriculum to help uh, schools make up the time lost you okay so I'm gonna hold on to trimming the curriculum and making up for time lost and I still want to honor your previous question about infrastructure if, is it okay with you? No, if I please do that? go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. So, in terms of the infrastructure challenges, there's infrastructure challenges that predated COVID and which we need to hold government accountable for in terms of addressing infrastructure backlogs. But the infrastructure backlogs that are specific, well, infrastructure challenges that are specific to COVID have been associated with the notion of a physical distance of one meter being somehow the magic figure that we have to subscribe to. But you see, I think what I've understood from the scientists is that there's a set of precautions and physical distancing is only one that can be counterbalanced with ventilation. We're in summer. If we have, with this airborne virus, good ventilation, if we have masks, it actually makes the one meter concern less of an issue. So the, the infrastructure's challenges, as we saw in the insert, are, are valid and important, but in terms of physical distancing, it's better to get children back in school. Now, when you talk about all of the challenges, curriculum trimming, how we catch up, the trimming of the curriculum is something that is going to be an ongoing work done by teachers in applying the guidelines of the DBE in their classrooms. Teachers have to respond to where their learners are no good teacher picks up the book and talks to the book without being observant of where the learners are. And you and I know that if you're not observant about where learners are, you soon know that they're not with you because they will play up. So teachers need to be using assessment to say this is where the learners are. They need to have sufficient understanding of the construction of the curriculum in their subject to be able to use their judgment with their colleagues and in discussion with their colleagues to say, where do I want these learners to be by the end of this week, this month, this term, this year, given where they are now? That means we need to give teachers more support. We need our school management teams at school level to work closely with them, structure time, for them to be able to talk to each other about the challenges they're facing in teaching and learning. Because we're not going to make up that time. That time is lost. 
what needs to be done now is careful planning that's responsive to the needs of children. So in your view, in this recovery plan, the rebooting of the education uh, system, just, I, 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 we obviously can't talk about it post-COVID, but uh, still on the theme of lessons learned. Mm. We spoke to Satu's General Secretary Mukwenye Maluleka the other day, and he was speaking about this, uh, the pedagogical impact of COVID-19, as you say, how teachers have had to learn how to adapt the, 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 the support that is needed. Is there sufficient acknowledgement of this? And I want to, while you answer the question, to focus specifically on non-fee paying school because uh, the observation was that they were significantly impacted by rotational schooling. Mm. Mm. The impact of rotation has been across the the country. You know, there's been research done, Martin Gustafsson at Stellenbosch University has estimated that in 2020 it was 54% of time lost, and last year it was um, at least 22% of time lost, I would say more. So it's been all schools that have been affected, and I'm not always certain that it's, the, it's based on quintiles. Um, there are some schools that are fortunate under the one meter rule, they were able to have more learners in classrooms. But there are, have been some schools that even in quintile one and two schools were really struggling to maintain the one meter schools, but the one meter rule. But the issue is that you, I think, are referring to is the impact of COVID on the inequality. And inequality is the greatest challenge, I think, in our country in so many ways. Now, one of the manifestations of the inequality when we had the one meter rule is that some schools were able to return and some weren't, whether or not it was by quintile. And the need to get all children back so that it isn't just some schools that could meet the one meter rule that returned and other schools that couldn't, that didn't, had to be dealt with, in my view. I was very distressed about that manifestation of the inequality. So now that all schools are going back, I think it's very important that the support is given, as uh, Magwena Maluleka has, I think, indicated to you, that we give pedagogical support and respect the professional judgment of teachers, which is not just whimsical, but it has to be evidence-based, tested with their colleagues, discussed, so that teachers are able to support each other. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Professor, that some uh, challenges have absolutely nothing to do with COVID. As we speak now, there's concern about some 190 storm hit Cosmotel schools as the academic year begins. Thank you so much for your time as always and your insights, Professor Mary Metcalf, education expert, speaking to us about 95% uh, of South African schools being able to go back.